Welcome to another episode of the Civ Div. Today we have a VFW rep, rep here. Pat, go ahead and introduce yourself. Thank you, Clayton. Uh, my name is Pat Murray. I'm the legislative director for the VFW here in Washington, D.C. I'm a Marine Corps veteran. I right, originally good. grew up in Rhode Island, joined the Marine Corps when I was 19. <laughs> Uh, deployed with 1st Battalion, 25th Marines to mm -hmm. Fallujah in 2006. After uh, about six and a half months to our deployment, got wounded, ended up at Walter Reed for about a year, transitioned out of there, stuck around in the D.C. area, worked for a general contractor for about five years, went back to school, then kind of got the bug for advocacy, um, working with student veterans, helping the transition process out of school, eventually linked up with the VFW. Uh, worked there since about 2016. Started covering education, employment, transition related issues. <clears throat> and now, uh, now that I'm the director, I have an opportunity to work with an entire team of fantastic advocates for veterans. We testify on Capitol Hill about 20 times a year. And I think I've testified myself anywhere 40 to 50 times now in the All about right. eight years. It's been a lot. Uh, and it's it's a privilege to get to do that for the VFW on behalf of service members, veterans, and families all across the U.S. All right. Awesome. Well, one, thank you for your service, right, especially being wounded. Um, that, that's pretty hardcore, actually. Um, back to a legislative director. I want you to talk to me like I'm still a Lance Corporal in the Marine Corps. What the heck does a legislative director for the VFW do? So uh, I manage what our legislative priorities are. Mostly it's access to high quality health care, education, and employment opportunities, quality claims and benefits assistance and military uh, quality of life issues. The VFW is a resolutions based organization, which essentially means our members vote on our resolutions, which drive our priorities. It's mm -hmm. my job as the legislative director to take our resolutions and kind of target those towards specific legislative asks. I work with a team, uh, not just my legislative team, but our veteran service team, which deals with the administration and policy and regulations combined legislative and the regulatory aspect. We try to push whatever our resolutions, whatever our members kind of want to see uh, enacted into law. It involves pushing for our issues and agendas. It also involves protecting against bad things that may erode any of the care and benefits that veterans have earned through service. All right. Well, let's just go ahead and jump into the hot topics of today. It's going to be PAC Act related VA claims. We're going to start there and really go down into just the culture, the current culture of VA disability claim, which is a bit on the hot seat right now. So with the PAC Act, you get a current diagnosis, you meet the time criteria, bada bing, bada boom, you're going to be service connected. That's the beauty of the PAC Act. Um, can you speak on the correlation between the PACT Act being passed in or backdated to August of 22, effective January of 23, the PACT Act standing up, and then all these VA disability claims consulting mom and pop shops, not just the huge claim sharks, right, but also the, the small claim sharks, if you will. Uh, what's the correlation between that legislation and these companies? Sure. So, uh, first off, for all your, your viewers, if you haven't uh, filed your PACT Act claim, please file the benefits you've earned. Also, access the health care. It can be life-saving. Mm -hmm. uh, but as you mentioned, the PACT Act, it was huge. We, we said that is uh, a, generational, um, a generational change. It's something that may be the largest expansion of VA care and benefits in the history or since the creation of the VA. With that, VA is sending out hundreds of billions of dollars annually. A lot of that is due to the PACT Act. The increase about half a million extra um, beneficiaries, we believe, will be affected by this. That's federal dollars going out into veterans' pockets. Mm -hmm. And there are some unscrupulous folks that want to take a cut of that. We believe that you have earned your benefits. They're yours, 100% of them. These folks should not take 5%, 10% off the top, three months of benefits, five months of benefits, whatever it might be, uh, without earning it. The veterans have earned it. Uh, there are some instances where if you do need to go to court, right, or, or before the, the Court of Appeals for Veterans Claims, 
you may need to enlist the, the assistance of an attorney, but that's an accredited attorney. Yeah. Those are people who follow the rules. Those are people who have guidelines. They're highly regulated. Those are things that we, uh, we want to see for anyone who's helping with a veteran's claim. Vetted and accredited mean a lot to us, uh, beca but because of the billions and billions of dollars going out the door from VA, a lot of folks are seeing that and a lot of folks are wanting a chunk of that. That's why we are so adamant about this claim shark issue. Generally speaking, no work needs to be done for a PACT Act related claim. Meaning if I have rhinitis, all I need, to, all I need is a diagnosis. I, I served in country wherever. Mm -hmm. That's it. Nothing else needs to be done. I go to my CMP exam, right? Hopefully I get a solid CMP examiner. That's a whole other topic, right? Um, but that's the plan. And so it really comes down to, you know, one, do we know or do we have proof that these companies are charging for PACT Act related claims? And then two, if they are, what work are they actually doing if it requires none? So, yes, they are definitely doing that. Uh, some of the larger claim shark companies have said we don't do uh, PACT Act or presumptive claims. But, yes, they do. Uh, you just need to file an extra form that says, I understand this is a presumptive condition. So it's not they don't do them. Some of them don't do them without making you check an extra box. But it, it is almost that. It is for the presumptive claims, uh, as you mentioned, right, rhinitis, sinusitis, um, some of the the ones that are just clinical diagnoses mm -hmm. those are very simple to get done uh, we encourage everybody to file your claim go to your cmp exam and get that done we want everybody to work with an accredited representative because they may be able to get them everything uh that they may be eligible for the things you may not know about um but worst case scenario that is something that can be done by the veteran individually because it is just such a straightforward claim it's not a lot of additional work to do that. Our service officers inform us around the country that this, these, some of these more simplistic claims take anywhere from 30 to 60 minutes to do. You should not get $10,000 for yeah. an hour's worth of work. That is like some high priced Wall Street lawyer billing fees. That's not right. That is completely unreasonable uh, besides the fact that there's other aspects of the claim sharking that we believe is predatory. It's also just an outrageous amount of money to charge for 30 minutes to an hour's worth of work. Which kind of brings me to my next point is we talk about these companies conducting predatory practices. We already got the PACT Act going. Anyone charging for a PACT Act claim, in my opinion, should be prosecuted to the full extent because that is highway robbery at that point, right? It's literally taking candy from a baby. Yes. Um, that's my opinion. I, I would argue it's objective, right? Um, now for other predatory practices, right? We have the insane fees, especially for presumptive conditions, which is wild. What are, when we say predatory practices, what are just a few of the predatory practices that these companies generally practice? So we believe that, uh, things like uh, insinuating that we're going to get you a higher, uh, result from mm -hmm. VA. Our service officers, we, we stress this, we tell them, we train them this every single year. We will never promise you anything higher. We will promise you what you've earned. We will fight to get you what you've earned. That may be an increase. It may not be. We never, we never try to coach you how to get to 100%, get more money. We also know that uh, some of these folks are preying on elderly, mm -hmm. um, widowers, which I think is disgusting, uh, taking from a surviving spouse. Also, some of the folks that are financially strapped, they're given almost like an incentive, a promise of we will get you this money as long as we get our cut first. Uh, that's predatory. There's also things that besides predatory, we believe are flat out illegal. They're using veterans' personal information, such as your social security number, uh, your VA login information, and using it to access government websites illegally. That's a way that some of these companies can find out when you got your increase and send you a bill the following day. It is highly illegal, uh, and we are working with uh, Congress and the administration to kind of knock this stuff out. So I, about a month ago, I had a professional discussion. It really wasn't a tit-for-tat kind, although it 
easily could have been. It was very professional, and I'm grateful for that. But I had interviewed Michael Licari, who was a formal attorney for Veteran Benefits Guide, who actually made a statement that contradicts that, saying that, to his knowledge, Veteran Benefits Guide has never used a social to do that. Um, is that just one company or can you can you combat that at all? Like, what does that culture look like of companies using veteran PII to log in and then them claiming that they don't? A another example would be VA Claims Insider has claimed mm -hmm. a billion times that they don't. But yet in the Texas Attorney General motion to file, there is proof. Yes, it's not it's not an opinion anymore. It's right. objective fact. So uh, it is very difficult to claim those things when people have receipts. Mm -hmm. uh, as you mentioned, Claims Insider, you just read the Texas suit. There is whole sections of screenshots where their coaches asked for that information. There are companies like Trajector who have a who had a form fill out your VA benefit or your VA.gov login information on the form. Uh, Mr. Lakari, I don't believe he was telling the truth. We have the contract from Veteran Benefits Guide and one of the required uh pieces of collection that they get is your client's social security number, your email address, phone number, date of birth, so they can log on to VA read-only websites. They also, in their contract, tell their clients not to file VA form 21-0845, which is the release of third-party information. So what that means is the VA can tell Clayton about uh, your file. They can't tell me about it. The only way they can tell me about it is if you authorize VA to speak to me as your authorized third party. By doing what Veteran Benefits Guide is doing, they're essentially, they are speaking to VA as if they're Clayton. That's against the law. Mm -hmm. So for them to say that, kind of untrue. Yeah, um, I, I, it's difficult to combat, you know, the hearsay. But whenever it's kind of black and white in a contract, and there's really only there's about a probably three or four reasons I can even think of. Like if I'm a company, why would I want your social security? Right. Probably the elderly, I probably want to grab their healthcare records. Imagine telling an 80-year-old veteran, hey, can you go to my healthy vet and download your blue button report? Probably not gonna happen, right? That's one reason. Another one is to submit the claim online. It's very, very easy to submit the claim online. And why would I have the veteran do it when I have their PII? And the third one is definitely just looking at um, really the predatory piece of it is you got an increase. My bills do. And that's exactly it. So the it's not illegal to uh, to speak to VA to communicate with VA on behalf of someone else as long as you're authorized legally mm -hmm. to do that. Uh, that's exactly where we believe that's a violation of Title 18, right? That's not uh, Title 38 is VA. Um, and we've said these claim charts for years are violating VA law. This is real law. This is U.S. Penal Code. This is fraud, right? Uh, wire fraud, identity theft, accessing government websites. So these are things, and, and you nailed it. It's not to for the betterment of the, the veteran. It's so that they know when to send the bill and exactly how much to build them. All right. So looking at it from, I'm, I'm going to play devil's advocate. Sure. Here, right. Someone who supports these companies or these companies themselves would say, you know, the veteran would not have been service connected for X, Y, Z, unless they went through us. Do you have, do you have any comments on that? Like how, how are, could you say these companies are helping veterans? That help is just a little backhanded, right? It's a little um, predatory, if you will. Um, it is. Uh, we will never you know, dispute whether or not some of their clients are successful. We will never dispute that some of their clients may be satisfied. But frankly, we don't legislate based on Yelp reviews. We legislate based on the law and facts. Uh, what they're doing is illegal. And veterans, some of them are seeking that out because they feel they're going to get a better result. What I would argue is, first, uh, you should be exhausting your free options. There is not a binary free option or the paid option. There are thousands of free options. And if you do have you know, a bad experience with a VSO, whether it's the VFW or anybody else, I recommend you contact 
your county service officer, your state service officers, reach out to the American Legion, the DAV, anybody else, an accredited attorney, an accredited agent, many of whom will do your claim for free before you even consider that. Those are things that we do feel uh, there's an appetite for another alternative. We understand that. But these companies also understand there's an appetite for it and they're exploiting it. As I mentioned, uh, uh, the you know the tens of thousands of dollars for an hour's worth of work, that's insane. I'm 100% service connected, uh, got that rating right after leaving the military. If I worked with one of these companies, I would owe them about $20,000. My exams are pretty straightforward because most of my ratings are physical injuries, but that is nuts to give someone 20 grand of my money that I've earned uh, that would help me help my family for doing an hour's worth of filing paperwork. I also interviewed the veteran. I forgot his name. Shame on me. But he's behind the lawsuit against Just for Veterans in Maryland. Had a whole live discussion with him. Um, really digging down into just his thought process or just what happened, right? And what he had revealed during the live chat is they, Just for Veterans, contacted him through LinkedIn. And it really gets at the, um, the predatory targeting of that. It's not just elderly. It's like, okay, if I want to target a veteran, where am I going? LinkedIn. Because now we know through... Transition readiness seminar and transition assistance, right? TRS and TAP. Veterans are told you get one year LinkedIn premium. LinkedIn is filled with veterans. And so that's where my audience is. And so now that company made contact with him first. And you ask yourself, well, why? And I can think of two reasons, okay? One, a BDD claim, benefits delivered rate discharge, is the easiest time to submit a claim. It's actually, if, if active duty service members don't submit a BDD claim, I, I'm, I'm kind of almost like puking my mouth a little bit. I'm like, man, you missed a golden opportunity. You still have the one year mark. Yep. You know, you can catch it on the back end. Um, but BDDs as a company, no work. Right. There's four things a service member needs to do to be service connected on a BDD. I always tell them, step one, make a list of everything that you were seen for. I don't care if you said your butt hurts one day, put it on the list, claim it, let the VA do VA stuff. Yep. I always tell veterans, the second thing you need to do is make a list of everything that hurts that you weren't seen for. That's the beauty of the BDD claim, because if you are still in service, if you have a chronic diagnosis, yep. service connected, yep. right? It's, it's, it would be very difficult to provide a nexus that goes against service connection in a BDD in claim service, process. Yeah. So that's one, one aspect of companies targeting new veterans you know so, so to speak is there is no work it's hey make me these two lists all right thanks let me spend 20 minutes submitting these on va.gov with your pii but by the way but we don't do that right that's one thing two is that's also the biggest avenue for an increase so if you're going to charge five times six times the increase they're all starting at zero you want to go from zero yep but when it comes to these companies and creating their arguments what i can't I cannot find a single argument as to why it would be any amount of ethical to charge for a BDD claim, to charge for an initial claim, and to charge for a presumptive condition. Those three specifically, I cannot find a single argument and create a good argument about why these companies would charge for those three. Is there an argument to be made for appeals? Sure, but then again, I'll recounter that with, well, why don't you just become accredited if you're going to work in exactly. appeals? Um, and so that's that's really my anytime my comments sections are wild. And anytime someone really comes comes at me with some good ar arguments for these companies, because, you know, they definitely have good arguments. If they didn't, they wouldn't be successful sure. when it comes to lobbying. Right. Some people would say lobbying. I would say corruption. That's neither here or there. Right. Um but I always kick back those three things, mm -hmm. BDDs, initial claims and presumptives. I just can't, it gets under my skin more than anything else. Right. And so um, do, do, do you have any thoughts on that before we transition to CMP exam? I, I do. Uh, so actually, and, and BDD is something that the VFW takes very seriously. We, we invest heavily on that. We have uh, BDD offices at 24 major installations. We, engage with about 20,000 service members every year. 
Uh, we file claims on behalf of anywhere from 10 to 15,000 BDD alone. Uh, we see making sure that service members have the care and benefits they have, you know, right after they drive out the gate for that last time as something critical. We've seen that first year post-service is maybe the most critical. Mm -hmm. right? You can really launch yourself forward to success. It also has some pitfalls there. Having that air cover of the health care, so you have the continuity of care, the continuity of pharmacy, you have the ability to have that ready to go. Also, your benefits ready to access them, whether it's your GI bill, it's your disability compensation, your VA home loan certificate of eligibility, things like that. Those are critical. So we invest heavily into um, putting employees at those areas. That's why we're pushing for a piece of legislation called the TAP Promotion Act to mandate that BDD is offered at as many locations as possible. You're absolutely right, though. It is a very easy thing to do. Uh, we need to get the medical records, right? That takes yeah. far too long. But uh, putting the claim in, you're absolutely right, because you're in service. All this stuff is still incident to service while you're in. Let's get that done now. Even if you don't feel you need it right there, if there's any active duty folks watching, even if you don't feel you need it today, don't wait until 10 years when you may need it. That's not the time to be messing around with bureaucracy. And BDD is quick enough. People aren't getting it right at service, but we're talking weeks mm -hmm. after service. That is very quick. So please do that if, if anybody can. If you know anybody still in service, get that done. It is very important. And you're right. They should not be taking advantage of the troops doing that. Oh, yeah. I just spoke to a chief warrant officer three who just retired in December um, of 23. It took him 18 days after he left the Marine Corps to be 100 percent through BDD. Right now. And I won't leave. I won't say his name because I don't have his permission to do do, do, do so. But um, he has spoke to a DAV rep mm -hmm. prior to going to. He was in the Marine Corps, so we used T T T R S. Um, prior to going to the transition readiness seminar, he already talked to the DAV, and lo and behold, he got a message on LinkedIn from a company because that's who they target, mm -hmm. right? New veterans saying, "Hey, I can help you get your benefits." Now, for whatever reason, he didn't respond to him. Thank God, right? He went through the DAV rep, figured out BDD was stupid easy, essentially, and then got 100% PNC. Had he sent one message back and started that dialogue and signed a contract, you know, he would be in the hole from transitioning. So you're going from a full-time job yep. to no job. And if you have, I have four kids. So he won't right? have back pay. Yeah. Yeah. So he won't I, get that retro payment to pay out of. Exactly. I, I have, you know, I have four kids. And so... People look at transitioning service members for some reason as single. That's like the that's like the standard. Mm -hmm. um, like when when someone talks about transitioning, they just never think about the family. But really, it's that service member, soon to be veteran, responsibility to provide for their partner, their children, their bills. You know, everything from a phone bill to a mortgage. All of that is combined. And imagine transitioning from service being preyed upon by a company when you know your evidence would have got you 100% PNT on its own and now you have this you know 16,000 let's just let's just give them the benefit of the doubt and say 10 grand right yeah. it's much more than that yeah. you have a $10,000 bill but you also have kids to take care of and you have no back pay because he got his benefits in 18 days yeah and it's just um it's just something that I'm never gonna get over it is I and think. uh you know, it, I, I'm sure your algorithm, right, is, is loaded with this because anytime you're now typing this in, uh, I'm getting all the ads just by the work that we're doing. Uh, you know, um, some of the companies, I mm -hmm. see so you type in one of them, you type in veteran benefits guy. If you go on any social media, you're now getting all of that. You're getting REE Medical, you're getting Veteran Guardian, you're getting Trajector, you're getting all these other companies. So, um, you know, it, it's a savvy business practice, I guess, you know, the targeted ads and marketing, but I don't like that you're who you're targeting, right? It's something that companies do, obviously, for a reason is to make more money. Yeah, it's not necessarily it's to make more money, get more clients, which mean more money, not necessarily because they're helping veterans. It's not through altruism. But in January, I believe January 4th, it's beginning January of this year, there's an OIG report that implied 
indications of fraud on DBQs and a part of the OIG's recommended steps because it always says, here's what you can do better, right? One of the steps is to require medical opinion providers like private practices to annotate a referral, right? So if VA Claims Insider referred you to the company that, you know, his uh, spouse works at, whatever, that's not a here or there, um, then the provider would have to say VA Claims Insider on the DBQ. And I want to get your first, are, 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 are you tracking that OIG report? Because it was kind of on the table almost. And two, what are your thoughts on just the implications of fraud from these companies? Because there's something in it for me. If you are 90 and you get 100, I get a payout. So is there a way I can refer you to a company that I know that's going to, you know, make things look worse? And then I'm going to say, hey, don't go to your CMP exam because mm -hmm. I know they're going to they're going to uncover the truth. Use this instead. Right? right. What are your thoughts on just the the OIG report specifically? Because we have to talk facts here. Yep. And the OIG report doesn't call anyone out, but it heavily implies fraud on private med medical pins and, and private dbq so i want to I hear your thoughts on that so uh yes um a couple things with that one we know va is looking at that they know there's fraud they're actually using ai to scrub some of the uh, dbqs to find out if there are almost like boilerplate statements made so that like you and i should not have the same ptsd stressor statement just say for the name mm -hmm. um so they are looking at things like that they know it exists uh that's it's going to be very difficult when they finally drop the hammer on that because it wouldn't be the company who's on the hook for that. It would be Clayton. And because your name is on that, they do not take ownership of that. That's why they wanted to require the referral. Uh, one of the issues, mm, these companies, we don't know exactly who is working with the veterans. They don't put their name on it. Like our accredited, sir, our accredited representatives have to put their accreditation number. They are under the VFW's accreditation, us, for example. And so if there's an issue, if there's fraud, we're also on the hook for some of this stuff. Our folks are trained ethically, right? They're, they're trained in privacy. They're trained in HIPAA. They're trained in all these things to make sure that we're not filing fraudulent claims on behalf of the veterans. But if you file a claim with any one of these companies, your name is on the hook. So that's what the referral is meant to kind of get to. So we can begin to understand Who's doing this? How many? We're working almost entirely off of like self-referrals, right? Some of the companies say we work with 10,000 veterans, 20,000 veterans, whatever it is. We don't know. Yeah. Uh, we don't know. Is it only 50,000 veterans or is it 100,000? Is it bigger? Uh, so those are problems. But VA has released a couple fraud alerts that flag for veterans DBQ related scams. And you're absolutely right. If you are trying to get an increase and i know the higher increase you get means more money i get i'm going to send you to a medical provider oftentimes who they have financial relationships with even though they say they don't it's bullshit. they have financial relationships with medical providers and it inherently incentivizes more evidence mm -hmm. to like juice the claim it's a it's a fine line we have to walk because we want veterans to, to give the full extent of what it is. Like, don't minimize. Don't dismiss. Don't, don't not talk about what may be affecting you. But also don't embellish it, right? Let's talk honestly about it, and hopefully you will get what you're, you've earned. Um, don't, don't copy and paste what you hear from YouTube, right? That's exactly even, it. Even in my own vi 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 videos, I always try... One of my most popular videos is 70% rating for mental health. I talk about three symptoms in particular, but the thing is, I always say is, well, what are your symptoms? Right. Right. Because if this ain't you and you start copying and pasting, that's, you know, you're crossing a line there. So I think it's, there's responsibility at all levels. There is, there is. And, and we want veterans to get every, everything they've earned. And you don't need to lie to do that. You know, we can get you everything you've earned. I, I think, unfortunately, part of the other issue is everybody is chasing that hundred. You know, mm -hmm. that, that stereotypical saying that, and a lot of us, well, Clayton got this. But Clayton didn't do this, or you know, why does he get that and I didn't? I should get that, or you know, uh, people not satisfied. 
we actively work to kind of just message folks, put, uh, put that message into folks' heads that you're getting, you're getting what you've earned. If you truly aren't getting what you've earned, let's work to get that. But it doesn't mean a number. We're not chasing a certain number. We're not chasing a certain dollar amount. We're chasing the care and benefits you've earned. Yeah, just be properly rated, right? Yes. Because hundred, everyone thinks 100% is the pinnacle. But 100% is you can live and work and have a mm -hmm. nice life. You might have some, you got some issues. Yep. And by the time you're 40, 50, 60, you're going to have a lot of issues. There are. Um, but that's not, you know, we say disability, but it's not really Social Security. It's it, it, VA oh, compensation. There's a lot of like uh, folks that conflate what might be, you know, SSDI, Social Security Disability, exactly. uh, that it is all or nothing. Mm -hmm. With veterans, disability, right? Mm -hmm. Obviously, you know, your, your folks, I hope know the, the scale, the rating mm -hmm. scale. Um, it's not all or nothing. And if something is still even 0% service connected, that is still a positive, right? It's not maybe as positive as 100%. But just having that 0% means this is service connected, the government will take care of this, there may be no compensation coming along with that. But that is care that can be provided for that zero percent thing so the the scale you know zero to 100 it's not all or nothing it's not an on switch for it exactly you know uh, someone at 100 percent isn't missing limbs or you know is absolutely insanely crazy like actually senile okay um medically senile i i i should say 100 percent you have a zero to 100 percent there's a whole other rating scale yes. on smcs right for amputees and when you talk about disabled, that's really where you're going to find this, the correlation of VA disability on the SMC scale. Especially, you know, I, I one of my friends is a rated SMCT, which is for TBI, and he gets, I think it's like eleven grand ish untaxed, and it's like um, he can't do anything, right? That's really where you'll where you'll find the VA disabled. Versus like, hey, I'm service connected at 100. percent I think it. I think they're two fine lines. And, and that's also something that there's something that maybe 100 percent right off the bat, right? If you're, um, you know, bilateral amputee, 100 mm percent, -hmm. right? Or you can have scarring, you can have PTSD, you can have a TBI, and you start adding some of these things up, and it is to 100 percent. Um, not every 100 percent is for one particular issue right like uh, your your friend that uh that may be for one thing or it could be from one thing and also 10 others right yeah. uh but that's what it is and that's why you know we want to get this stuff documented we want to get this stuff annotated in your file so that uh, again even if it's not an issue today you said when you're 40 50 60 when you start to get older then's not the time to do that mm -hmm. that knee pain you had when you were 22 is going to be now it's debilitating when you're 52 <laughs> instability and you have no cartilage yeah. right moving on to cmp exams because this is i have a strong opinion about cmp exam examiners just the culture around it and it really goes back to the oig report or oag report in 2022 that essentially called the va out and said you're not following proper procedures for two things one um sending the relevant medical evidence to the cmp examiner how could the examiner possibly create a nexus without the evidence it's impossible. All right. Um, and then two, the VA scheduling unwarranted CMP exams. And I know this is this is a different subject other than claims companies, but these predatory claim consulting companies are using the culture of VA bad, you know, VSO bad to to rope in almost this like cult like following from what I found, at least in my comment section. And so what can veterans do when it comes to their C and P exams, especially if they have the evidence, whether the VA didn't send the proper evidence, what do they do then? Or two, um, the VA did send the proper evidence and they have the in-service events and they have the current diagnosis, but the examiner failed to make the net nexus. What, what's the veteran's next step? So uh, first, you know, we always want everybody to be armed with it, all the information ahead of time. So, you know, go into this gathering all your medical documentation, all your service documentation, everything you possibly can before you even start, whether you do it on your own or work through an accredited VSO. Uh, and I agree with you. It's an issue that the VFW has been chasing for years, the overdevelopment of mm -hmm. claims, the uh, 
what we believe are redundant, unnecessary examinations. You shouldn't need to go for something again and again and again. Even if you have a DBQ from a private doctor, especially if it's a, a practicing uh, medical provider, which means like you have a history with them yep. and VA will take and then send you to their person as well. That's unnecessary. Um, we talked a little bit about what I believe are some of the unscrupulous uh, medical exams, but even if it is an above board, completely legitimate exam, oftentimes they send you for a, another VA exam. It just creates more of a backlog. It creates a log jam in the system. It puts a burden on the veteran to then just have to do more things. And it makes the, the, the process more arduous. Um, it's where we know people feel that things are adversarial. Um, but we are actively working to fight against that because it is a real problem. Uh, if they are not making that proper nexus, work with your uh, accredited representative, work with some help to help either craft that, give the right kind of, you know, uh, lead the horse to the water to make that happen. Mm -hmm. It is something that veterans can influence on their own if they go into it armed, knowing what they're trying to do with the proper information to speak to the examiner, to try to get to that nexus point. Um, so it's, it's preparation beforehand. This is an application for healthcare and benefits. It may seem daunting and sometimes it is, but there are ways to help and there are people that know how to do that. So that's my recommendation to veterans is speak to someone who knows the system and can arm you uh, so that day one, when you start this, you're ready to go. I always tell people that the CMP examiners, one, they don't necessarily work for the VA, they're just contracted, but then looking at government contracting, it's subcontracts on subcontracts on subcontracts, right? And so if you have a, a poor CMP exam, it is absolutely the veteran's responsibility and, and to advocate for themselves, just saying, hey, this CMP exam was not right. Um, maybe that's a personal statement. I'm not really sure what that looks like. Um, we'll have to find out. What I did want to bring up is since Senator Warren um, just Very required recently. for um, the VA to the secretary personally and was like, hey, I want answers on the CNP exams that's due by May 14th, which is in about 12 days from right now. Right. So I am really excited to hear these answers and I don't want to get too heavy down the conspiracy hole. Right. But if there is a is the, if there is a VA conspiracy. It would be, you know, um, prior, and we'll kind of just take this at face value, prior VA secretaries running contract exams, winning these contracts for the VA. And then now we have this cycle of the, in my opinion, this is my strong opinion I mentioned earlier, the only speed bump in the VA claims process are CMP examiners. I believe that uh, one, veterans have the knowledge to understand their own process, right? I, I'm never going to get on board that veterans are stupid. I'll call them stupid when they submit a claim without a <laughs> diagnosis. I'm like, just don't do that, right? Um, but veterans are smart. They can figure out the process as it pertains to them. They don't have to understand M21, TAC1, right? Um, I believe VSOs are well equipped, equipped to, at a minimum, submit the claim. At bare minimum, Submit it, right? Anything else on top of that is just candy, right? Saying, hey, oh, you have a CMP exam for your lower back. Maybe you think about the nerve damage in your legs, right? That would be like the cherry on top. Um, I believe, believe it or not, I believe VA adjudicators, um, when given evidence, make the right choice. And there's processes in place like the higher level review. I had to do a higher level review because I had the evidence. Boom, service. it took five days, right? So there are processes in place. In worst case scenario, we have VA accredited attorneys that are really going to wheel and deal in like your supplemental claims and then your board of appeals, right? And that's that's definitely not the majority. It's a very, very small niche set of claims. Um, but then you have these CMP examiners that are, I've had both experiences and, and I like to speak in facts here. So I'll just talk about my experiences. I've had CMP examiners that were awesome. You know, they actually asked me questions about my service. They were like, oh, man, you, you, you went to Afghan and Syria. He was like, that's that's pretty cool, man. Like, why, why are you here? Talk to me about it. And they were just open to talk. Yeah. I've also had the complete opposite where 
it was almost don't speak unless you're spoken to. Uh -huh. And I probably said this was the migraine claim. Go figure, right? I probably said um, maybe, maybe 15 words uh -huh. during the migraine CMP, um, which was it was just combative and the, the energy wasn't there. There was no customer service aspects zero that came back at zero percent now me not being a dumb veteran i knew i had the evidence so i did a hlr boom easy peasy that's the day right that's that's an easy day but the cmp examiner in my opinion remains the one variable the one speed bump in the claims process i would probably make the argument that You'll, you'll see people on social media, and I'm sure you've read a million comments of if VSOs, if VSOs weren't so bad, these companies wouldn't exist. If the process were easier, they wouldn't be here. Yeah. Yeah. Just by just by the fact they exist shows that there's you know a potentially reason. I've heard that argument plenty of times. It's it's not unfounded, you know. Um, there are problems in the system, mm -hmm. and you're absolutely right that um you know, the, the CMP exam is where you're going to get the most variability. Uh, things like your service record are black and white. Yeah. Right. Uh, what the Raiders have, by and large, they, they are given information and they base that off of what the rating schedule is. And then, you, you know, submit that there. <clears throat> but if they're basing that off of bum scoop, then mm -hmm. you may not get what you earned. Uh, so that is where the, the process can kind of immediately get off the rails if, if there is a bad exam. VA switched over to almost entirely contract examinations a couple of years ago, a few years ago. Yep. Um, and I, I hear you that, you know, uh, are some of these maybe uh, well influenced? Possibly. But that's where we really need to do a better job cleaning up because that is the base. That's the foundation of your claim so that when that gets to the Board of Veteran Appeals, they they can like properly adjudicate that because mm -hmm. there was something good to go off of. If it's unknown, well, then we're starting all over again. And, and that may be months or years going back in time to try to get what they've earned right. Yeah. Um, I, I, I would probably make the argument there are three kind of root causes to these claims consulting companies making millions of dollars. And and just a side note, you know, yes, they are taking veterans benefits, but make no mistakes. That's taxpayer dollars. It right? is absolutely so Uncle Sam dollars. They are yeah. in the most literal sense taking American taxpayer dollars. Mm -hmm. That's a whole other, that's a whole other subject. Right. Um, but if I had to number the root causes, I think I would put personally CMP examiners at the top. A one bad CMP exam is going to result in a, den a denial. What happens with that veteran is irritability. That would probably be an understatement, right? You're denied. You say, whatever, screw it. I'm not going to touch it. That was in 2015. All of a sudden, a company reaches out to you. You're like, fine, go ahead. If, if you can do it, go ahead. And then all of a sudden you're now a part of their algorithm as, and they're targeting you for your tax, your, your, do, 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 excuse me, dollars, right? That's CMP examiners. Number two is I would actually say, you know, I think we have to be real and say, are there bad VSOs or are, are there VSOs that aren't as good as others? And I would probably say, yes, you know, I, I would agree with you on that. To be honest, there's, there's dissatisfaction sometimes. Mm -hmm. Um, I would it, making this statement, you know, much like with VA and with VSOs, most people are satisfied with this stuff. Yeah. But the people who aren't can't be dismissed as irrelevant, right? Or or an outlier. Because if you have a bad experience, you don't care that 90% don't, or mm -hmm. whatever the percentage is, because to you, that's the most important thing. That there are VSOs who need to do better. We try to improve every single day. We we will never claim to be perfect. But what we do not do is scam you. We don't rip you off. We work to get better every single day. There are there are not enough services sometimes. But we should improve those services, not 
put the onus on the veteran to then pay for it. So there, there are absolutely gaps that we're, we are looking for real accreditation reform, real service improvement for some of these folks. Unfortunately, accreditation reform has taken uh, the track of, well, how much can I make? It's not accreditation reform. Yeah. Oh yeah. I completely agree. And my personal experience, and I won't say the organization, um, but I went on Quantico, I met with a VSL. I had zero. I'm just like every other Marine. I had no idea what's going on. I know I got stuff happening. So mm-hmm. I'm going to go talk to a VSL. Um, this person was very old, probably in the 80s. And I'm guessing let's just say 70s to, you know, um, and just wasn't able to turn as, something as simple as log on to, to the computer. It couldn't happen. And that right there, I was like, OK, this was basically pointless. And that. I could have easily been directed to a claims co- company. Sure. Just looking at my life in that time, because I did have kids, I was transitioning, I had no job on the outside, I needed something. Um, I, I could see myself making the decision to go with a company. What did end up happening is right next door, and this is what I tell veterans, is just like you would shop for an attorney. Mm-hmm. You know, hey, I'm not really vibing with that attorney, let me go to this one. Or... Um, you know, I don't like, uh, this candy bar. I'm going to go get that candy bar, whatever it is. People shop and make decisions every day. You can do that with VSLs. Mm -hmm. You're saying, Hey, for whatever reason, I don't jive with this person. I'm going to go right next door. And let's say someone works with the VFW. If they had a bad, bad experience with that one rep, do you know off the top of your head how many reps VFW has? So the VFW probably a ton. I don't know. I mean, yeah, we, we accredit. I believe it's uh, uh, twenty three hundred about uh, around the country. That's not all VFW employees. Some of those are our national employees. Some of them are state employees because each VFW mm-hmm. state is its own department, its own entity. They have their own service officers. A lot of who we accredit are county service officers and state service officers. Uh, that's a lot of who we do across the country. And if you work with anyone who is a VFW accredited service officer, you know, if you put your claim in here today with someone from our office, and then you move to Washington state and get with someone up there who's a county service officer who holds a VFW accreditation, they have access to your file. It's all in the same network. And the same thing with DAV and the same thing with the American Legion. They also accredit, uh, you know, thousands of people around the country. We talked about the proliferation of um, some of the claim sharks about PACT Act. COVID also drew, drove a lot of that up because we as a country were forced to go virtual. And I don't know how when we would have naturally organically gone that way, uh, you know, without that. So that is the silver lining of that whole crap hole that went on. Mm-hmm. But that gave us the ability to go virtual, not only VSOs, but some of the claim sharks. So now if you're in California, the claim shark company in North Carolina can reach out and provide you those services as if you're in the same town. It used to be we had to be face to face to do it. It's not the case anymore. Same thing with VSOs. You're in Virginia. If you reach out to a Virginia Department of Veteran Service service officer and the, the person around the corner here is full, you can go to the one in the western part of the state yep right here online next it's just county, that ne- easy next county over right? next county over um so that is the silver lining of covid forcing us to do all that is we all had to adapt we all had to be able to connect via the internet so that's what you can also do with service officers it doesn't need to be the first one you walk in into their office in person if they can't serve you or frankly if you're not satisfied Find the next person. Yeah, it it really gets at the claims consulting, probably their best argument. If I had to, you know, rank their arguments from a legal perspective is the veteran should have choice. I think I can agree with that. Um, What they are implying, though, are either or, you Mm -hmm. know, paid or free. Right. Um, When in reality, there already is choice. There is. Because I didn't want to use the, you know, the older gentleman just wasn't my thing. I walked maybe 12 steps down the hallway and met with a, it was a Virginia service VSO. Yep. And then I got my free choice. Right. Yep. And so veterans have choice. They do. Um, the issue is there's this, uh, you know, the loudest voice in the room is heard. 
And so if claim sharks are through algorithms, through search engine optimization, through Google and buying data, essentially is what, what, what they're doing to figure out leads saying, ooh, this person is probably a veteran based on their Facebook profile. Now Facebook can drop my ad in there. They are everywhere, right? It's, it's social media has made small issues really, really big. And that's the claim shark culture, at least in my opinion, that's how I would view it. Um, and I, I want to ask you a question is, do you see a world five, 10 years, maybe tomorrow, I don't know, where accredited VSOs kind of take a similar approach of advertising to veterans and just saying, hey, um, essentially being louder than claim sharks. Is that, is that, has that been thought of? Um, what does that look like at all? Uh, yes, 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 yes. I, I, I wish we could always do more of that. Uh, we, the VFW is a nonprofit organization, right? We, we have limited resources. We do try to advertise. However, you know, we, we are not able to spend the million dollars in marketing the way some of these other folks are. Yeah. Uh, I mean, even some of the other VSOs as well, right? You drive down some of the highways, you'll see a sign for DAV, right? Um, go work with them for your benefits. The VFW we launched, uh, don't feed the That's mm -hmm. our, that is our referral site. So if you go on that, uh, put in your information, it's going to send your information to a service officer in your area. They have three days to reach out to you, get in touch and begin that process. The states and the counties, their budgets are even slimmer than ours. So you're right. We are at a disadvantage there of letting people know about what's out there. So they don't think that that individual you met with at Quantico is not the option. Yeah. We do a, we have a difficult time letting people know that there are thousands of free options that are available to you. So there is choice already. There's choice in the market. And frankly, there always has been, but we are not as good as telling people about it. I, I, if there's ever a world where I could support um, broadcasting VFW stuff, let me know. Okay? Feel free to donate. <laughs> uh, go to VFW.org. But uh, no, it's, in all seriousness, we, we, we do work off um, not only just membership dues, but the generosity of uh, things like that. But we are a nonprofit. We have, we have a budget we have to adhere to. If you ask anyone in our professional organization, you know, could we – would we like to have a million dollar advertising and marketing budget? Mm -hmm. The answer is absolutely. Um, but you know, we, we, we work with what we can. Oh yeah. And, and talking about money and just the ability to do things, these companies are going to outspend anyone. We can see that anyone with a brain cell and Facebook account can see that, right? Facebook advertising. I looked into it cause I was going to do it. It's a lot. Okay. I was like, yeah, that's not me. <laughs> I'll stay on YouTube. All right. Um, but the, when you look at, for instance, Veterans Guardian donating to Congress, right, senators, state house, um, it is it's almost impossible to to outspend these companies. And I, I want to know, I want to hear your thoughts specifically on Veterans Guardian because when you look at the federal stage, you can almost kind of like segue. You know, um, VA Claims Insider has their hands full right now. Yep. They are, they've actually been pushing a lot on YouTube, probably to generate some income to feed some uh, lawyers. If I had to take a wild guess, that's a joke, but uh, uh, it's there. I think they're going to need some money here pretty soon. <laughs> but then you see Veterans Guardian, who's really the, you know, another massive claim shark, really have play in the federal level. And I want to know your thoughts um, on VFW being, I'm sorry. Veterans Guardian being the number two do donor to the senator behind the Plus Act, and just what what does you know we say lobbying? I would say corruption, um, and I get that's a that's a aggressive term, but it is what it is. You're you're sure. paying for legislation to be passed, and and it's uh, you know morals and values are always twisted when someone drops millions of dollars in your lap. It is. I don't think I could make the right decision if someone said, here's five mil. I, would like, be, oh. I, I think, right. you know, uh, you know, we, we all kind of joke, you know, what would you do for a million bucks? You know, I'm sure we've all had that conversation <laughs> before sitting around in your packs at the range, having those fun times. But uh, some of this is some pay for play. If you look at, as you mentioned, veteran guarding, you can go to OpenSecrets.com, check out their lobbying profile. They've 
spent $1.5 million alone in the past three years just here in Washington, D.C. There's uh, some of the other companies, Veteran Benefits Guide as well. They have multiple subsidiaries, so it's a lot more difficult to kind of it pin varied. down exactly which one. Uh, and that's just here in D.C. If we look around at what they're spending in the states mm -hmm. to fight the state claim shark bills, there's some that we can point to in California. For example, they're spending $40,000 a month. We can never compete with things like that. Uh, the One of the, the false arguments that they make about VSOs is that we're all volunteers. We're not. Our, our veteran service officers are paid professionals. They're highly trained. Uh, but the folks who are doing our uh, advocacy around the country are volunteers. So we have folks who are on, like, for example, the VFW's Legislative Committee who are pushing for state bills around the country. They are doing this in their spare time. They are up against full-time lobbyists in every single state. There are places where we are advancing our bills, but we are up against a powerhouse with a big bank account to spend. I mean, just imagine how much help you could give to veterans with one and a half extra million dollars for things, mm -hmm. but instead they're spending it to continue getting their ill-gotten gains. Uh, you have heard them say that they lose money on about half their claims. You can't lose money on half your business if you have one and a half million to spend on lobbying alone just here in DC. That's what we're up against. We're up against big time bank accounts mm -hmm. and we are trying to take on, uh, and the VFW is not a nobody, but we can't compete with that. We also can't donate. You know, our congressional charter, we are prohibited from doing so. Um, so we are fighting that with one hand tied behind it's our back. Essentially being outclassed. We, we are being outspent left and right. But as our commander said in our testimony, we have the law and the moral high ground on our side, and we are not going to give up. Awesome. Awesome. Um, I do want to transition over to the a quote by the main senator who just passed their state version of the Guard Act, yep. right? That prohibits these sharks, which is I'm all for. New yeah. Jersey and Maine to get, a, get a thumbs up. New York also. New York. Awesome. Uh, great job, everybody. But uh, New York was 2019. New Jersey was 2023. Maine was a couple weeks ago, yep. weeks ago, whatever it is. There, he he said a quote. I'm 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 I'm, I'm going to paraphrase here, but he essentially said that it really does show something that when out of state firms, meaning claims sharks, claims co 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 companies, um, go to Maine to testify, it really indicates like the lucrative bit 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 bit, bit, bit business. Excuse me. Um, Maine only has about a hundred thousand ish veterans. Um, and you just imagine, let's say 2%. So 2000 veterans, right. Um, go from 90 to hundred percent and they have to pay a five times the increase. I'm not sure what that math is, but it's going to be a little more than seven grand and what 7,000 times 2000. I can't do math, right. I'm not even going to try at least not uh, on video, but, um, even two percent of a hundred thousand is a is a serious amount of money that just five times the increase would, would yield. And so that's really what Maine Senators was getting at is the business is extremely profitable. And one of the questions I asked Michael Lacari, and just to be clear, we had a great conversation. There's really no animosity, right? Um, but I did ask challenging questions and he gave it right back. And that's what I, I kind of thrive on. That. Sure. But I asked him, why charge so much? Why is it five times the increase? You know, if if these companies operated at a very low, low charge, I don't think we would see, you know, the fire under everyone's seat to really, really go after these. So I asked him why they charge a, a lot. And he essentially said because they have to have HIPAA compliant servers and cybersecurity and just cost of the business. And I was like, okay, so you are handling medical records then, right? I was like, what's, you know, when it comes to cyber policy, my degrees in cyber policy, I teach cyber, it's a bit nerdy, but there's standards and regulations that companies have to fall in line, whether that's medical standards or, um, you know, federal contracting with like secrets and top secrets sure. and stuff like that. And uh, it's just another, the more you dig, the more you uncover of, the more you clean, the more dirty, the more dirt you'll find, right? 
And so that's just one example of these companies um, looking at state legislations. Can you speak on Louisiana? Because this one I'm kind of confused about. I truly don't. I get New Jersey. I get New York. I get Maine. Easy. I understand where Virginia's at, unfortunately. Um, I'm tracking on Cal California, which is really the mammoth of the states mm -hmm. and their veterans. Um, I do not understand Louisiana. I'm, I'm confused. So talk to me like I'm a Lance Corporal of the Marine Corps. Sure. So first, uh, besides some of the ones you mentioned, uh, Delaware, it's waiting for its final vote. Uh, Rhode Island is waiting to be advanced to uh, the floor for a vote in Illinois. It passed the state Senate unanimously. It's waiting for its vote in the House. Missouri, it voted in the House yesterday. Unfortunately, I've been incredibly busy, haven't had a chance to follow and catch up exactly how that went. But there's um, there's multiple states that have this kind of right on the precipice of passing. In Louisiana, yesterday, the uh, State Director of Veteran Affairs, Charlton McGinley, testified about how... Uh, their version of the Guard Act is the good one. Uh, their version of the PLUS Act is the one that they oppose. They did an, a great job outlining, you know, the, the pros and cons of each uh, proposal. They, he had his uh, general counsel outline what is illegal about this practice and what these companies are doing and what they're doing is illegal. The legislators in uh, Louisiana asked essentially you know can these two bills coexist and it was plainly stated no it is one or the other they advanced the state guard act unanimously i think it was 12 to nothing maybe they advanced the state plus act nine to three i don't know what that means to be honest uh we, we're we're working with some of our folks in louisiana they had everybody there right uh in favor of it, the VFW, the American Legion, Purple Heart, DAV, um, other interested veterans alongside uh, the Secretary of Veteran Affairs down there. We're not sure how this goes. Uh, there have been other states that they have advanced favorably their state version of the PLUS Act. Uh, an example, Arizona, it passed, I think it was the state senator to the state house, ultimately before getting killed because the state's attorney general weighed in and said, this is unconstitutional. Uh, Could that be because it's illegal? It is. Wild. Who would have thought? It right? is. So, uh, <laughs> and the crux of that is uh, federal law is the law of the land. The supremacy clause mm -hmm. is what is commonly known as. And federal law says you cannot charge for initial claims assistance. So states can't say, yes, we can, but only $12,000. Yeah. That would be unconstitutional. That will get challenged in court and we believe thrown out uh, almost immediately. So as was stated by Secretary of VA down in Louisiana, a state plus act is putting the cart before the horse. If the plus act here in D.C. were to pass, they would be allowed to do that. Different story. But it's not. So they can't. And these claim shark companies know what they're pushing is unconstitutional, yet they're still trying to do it. They're still trying to muddy the waters and just continue to kick this can down the road because no action keeps their lights on. It mm -hmm. keeps their business going. So the more they can just spend their money to just keep things confused, it's in their favor. We we need to have a discussion with some of our folks. This is just very recent about Louisiana and how that will all play out. But uh, the other states we are working in, and these are our, our folks around the country who are doing fantastic work. They are up against professional lobbyists. We believe we're about to get a handful of states across the line this year alone. So we're very encouraged about what's going on. I think it goes back to the VFW commander saying the law is on your side, right? And so, yeah, you might, you may be, it's fact, the, v, the VFW is outclassed when it comes to donations and lobbying. We are. Corruption is what I, I, I would deem it, <laughs> right? Um, you're outclass, But at the end of the day, the law. It's federal law. And if, the plat, if the plus act is passed, it's a whole new Different ball story. Game, right? It's a yep. whole. I have told my channel many, many times, if plus act is passed, I'll shut up. I won't be happy about it. But, hey, it's the law of the land at that point. It is. But it's not. Yes. And so I'm going to keep blabbing my mouth, right? <laughs> Um, I do want to transition to really looking at, you know, do you, you know, speaking for the VFW or your own personal opinion, is there any kind of compromise that you could see 
between accreditation and these um, predatory claims consulting co companies? So uh, short answer, no, not right now. Uh, we will work with people who follow the law. We are not interested in coming to the table with criminals. Uh, you should not have brought Bernie Madoff to the table to talk about Wall Street reform. You should not have brought Bonnie and Clyde to talk about banking reform. When you start following the law, let's have a discussion. We're not intractable. We are not against speaking and working with anybody who may be genuinely interested in good things for veterans, even if ultimately we may disagree. Mm -hmm. In 2006, attorneys were not allowed to charge uh, you know, for their services uh, in helping veterans appeal. We worked with the accredited agents and attorneys at the time, uh, or sorry, agents and attorneys at the time, they weren't accredited yet, uh, for a pathway forward because they're held to ethical standards. They're held to their state bars, um, ethical standards. And there were rules put in place to do that. If the agents and attorneys came and said, hey, we would like to have a discussion about changing what fees are allowable, right? Right now they're not allowed to charge for initial, uh, initial claims. If they came to us and said, let's talk, we would have to talk because they are the good actors in the space. Mm -hmm. We may disagree with them. We may not come on board with that, but that's who we would work with. If these companies became accredited and started following the rules and then said, hey, let's talk about changing things, let's talk. Until that point, follow the law or hit the bricks. All right. I couldn't agree more. And what's funny is I've been asked this question multiple times, not from a VFW standpoint, just from my own personal. And I've always said that I would compromise if these companies, and then I start listing out some banks. And what I list out is what a claims agent can do and cannot do. It's, exactly it's essentially right. saying be accredited, um, meaning why it's predatory to charge for initial claims. One. Um, appeals, different ball game. There's actual work that needs to go into appeals, right? And that's really where you'll find your agents and attorneys shine are supplementals and higher level reviews. Or, I mean, sorry, the Board of Appeals. HLRs is an argument, debatable. You can get by with that one. Um, but if these companies were to become a, an agent and charge in appeals only, I have zero complaints, right? And and frankly, we've we, we say this, right? We put out different memes, videos, we've testified on this, we've said it in serious facts, we've said it in lighter uh, mediums, but there's nothing stopping you from getting accredited. Mm -hmm. uh, they claim, well, no, our company can't get accredited. It's the first correct thing they've said all day, right? You're right, companies can't get accredited, individuals can though, the same way an attorney is admitted to the bar, not the law firm. A doctor holds a medical license, not the hospital. Your company is not going to get accredited. The individuals can, though, today, and there's nothing stopping them per the BS arguments. Well, we have we have 200 employees. How are we going to do that? VFW accredits 500 every year, right? Our, our network of 2,300, but we accredit 500 every year, and we're not the only organization that does that. It's bogus. They don't want to. The I believe the founder or CEO, but Bill Taylor from Veteran Guardian testified in 2022 when asked why not. He said they won't make enough money. Now in 2024, they're going around the country saying that the accredited agents and attorneys are perversely incentivized. They're actually making too much money. So which one is it? They don't want to because there's rules and oversight. That's mm -hmm. the bottom line. They're continuing right, right. to rake in cash and any kind of constraints on that they view as a threat to their business model. Get accredited. Accredited agents and attorneys drive much nicer cars than I do. There is money to be made, but they do it ethically. They do it the right way. Mm -hmm. And Mo, I am personally a fan of attorneys. Like if a veteran comes to me with questions, I'll answer questions every now and then. Um, when it's a difficult supplemental claim, especially if you have the evidence, but you had a poor CMP examiner, maybe you need to go to the board or whatever that looks like. I'm personally a fan of an accredited attorney or agent. Um, I was speaking with one of my p p p people I did a live stream with who's an accredited attorney. His name's Andy. Um, something that these companies can't do is look at your C file, mm -hmm. right? And so an accredited attorney could be like, whoa, back in 2009, there was a mistake here. And so that, you know, oh, let's submit an increase. The attorney would be like, no way. We're going to go back and fight this. And so that 
10 grand, you know, back pay just turned into 170 or 270. I've seen a $270 back pay. And I'm just oh like, yeah. Clayton, we, we've, nice. we just very recently worked with a veteran who uh, was in that exact scenario. Our, our training manager actually found a queue from either like, let's say 2016, 2017. And it would have been the difference between like a, let's say a 30 to 40% to a 70%. Mm -hmm. So all that, right. Um, all that back to that point was like a hundred thousand dollar difference of something that should have been cost the right time wasn't though but if they had gone to a claim shark they would have just filed the claim for an increase right you would have gotten maybe the 30 to 70 correct that time and then it would have charged them for it instead free of charge here you go you now have the correct rating and it was it was an error missed by you know the rater at the time or whatever it was mm -hmm. Uh, Q and for those that aren't tracking, it's a clear and unmistakable error. It is just an error. Our bad. We messed up. Sorry. Here you go. Those things can only be found if you can actually access the system. If you can't, you're doing it kind of blind. Don't know what you don't know. Exactly. Right. But um, so, something that cracks me up is everyone says these companies don't use their PII to submit their claims. Um, it's weird just because it's like, that's the, as far as all the comments I get, that's probably number one, but there's evidence of the exact opposite. That is blatant. We saw that in multiple lawsuits, not just, you know, VA claims and outsider. Um, the last thing I do want to, to talk about is bringing it down. You know, we talked high level pretty much this whole video, bring it down to the veteran Joe Schmo, right? Smokatelli, whoever. Um, what is your advice if they had one bad experience with the VSL, right? Because that one bad experience could completely turn them off the benefits altogether. It could turn them to a claim shark. It could turn them to, you know, going on social media and just blabbing about the VA this, VA that, VSOs this, VSO that. And, and it, does, it does exist, right? And so to bring it down to the veteran level, what would be your, your take home advice? So first, I think the, the worst, the worst scenario on that is if a veteran has a bad experience, they pack it in and go home, right? Not accessing the, not having access to the care and benefits that they've earned. Uh, that just saying this is too hard, screw it. That's actually worse than going and paying for it. Benefits, things like your economic opportunity benefits, right? Your GI bill, VR and E, your home loan are transformative benefits. They can really launch you forward not and, and the gateway to that is vba right mm -hmm. also the healthcare it can save lives going for just primary care appointments and getting blood draw can save your life unfortunately you know too many folks with burn pits uh exposure agent orange exposure after all these years we're showing up with like stage three cancers then looking for care too often that's too late get ahead of this stuff. So that's actually worse. If you have a bad experience, please don't just say, screw it, I give up. That is the worst. Um, if you do have a bad experience, reach out to anybody else. It, oftentimes, you know, much like with a job interview, an informational interview is a great way to get that next step instead of just asking, hey, can you hire me? But talking to people. If their initial response is, yes, we'll talk to you. Also, here's our fee run yeah there are so many people that will talk to you for free whether it's a vso whether it's your state whether it's even just a veteran you know speak to someone do not get discouraged and do not think that you just immediately then have to pay for it there are so many options but continue pushing forward with that keep charging because the positive that comes out of the care and benefits that we've earned through service means so much um, there are too many veterans who make a fatal final decision because they are fed up. We don't ever want uh, a denial or a bad experience to lead to things like that. Uh, we are, that's one of the things we're always trying to get better so that things like that get down to zero. Um, but keep going, keep pushing, keep talking to people. Please reach out to the VFW, reach out to the other accredited service organizations, reach out to your county, your state, anybody. Keep keep talking about it all right well thank you very much pat and the vfw for being here on the channel i definitely appreciate it 
last words, anything you want to tell the veteran community before you head out? Don't feed the sharks. <laughs> um, no, I, I thank you very much uh, for having this opportunity. This is great to get to speak to your platform. Um, as we kind of talked about beforehand, I understand that not everybody agrees with us. Mm -hmm. I understand that, that there are people who believe that choice is paramount, and I respect that. Right? I, I value choice as well. And we work to keep providing choice, but also keeping people who exploit veterans away from them. Um, and I, I want everybody to understand that that just because we may disagree about things, that we are not trying to hurt other veterans. We're not trying to, to limit things for other veterans. Just like everything else in our discussion, this is not binary. Stopping a service doesn't hurt veterans. Stopping an industry doesn't hurt veterans. There's also things we are actively trying to do to expand services for veterans, to make the CMP process better so that you know that 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 comment about you know uh if it wasn't this bad they wouldn't exist help us end that help us make it uh so it's not that bad and and make your voice heard um reach out to your legislators join an organization right and this isn't necessarily just a pitch to join the vfw but if anybody is eligible and would like to please join the vfw or any organization whether it's rwb Right, whether it's Wounded Warrior Project, their alumni network, whether it's the American Legion, whether it's VFW, whether it's Rubicon, any organization can help amplify that because just like when we we're in service, how many times did you do things alone? Mm -hmm. Right. It was always your your squad, your platoon, your section, whatever it might be. We're better together, we're stronger together. So please use your voice, be active, um, and engage. Engage just like you know, we're we're still serving in various capacities i want everybody to still keep joining we joined once you know we raised our right hand keep joining join a civic organization join anybody and make your voice heard that's my plea to everybody you know reach out to us reach out to you reach out to anybody and let's try to always make things better even better than how we found them all right well thanks very much for coming i definitely appreciate it thank you very much clayton all right